You are listening to Shipwrecked in the Land of King Tobacco, the first Washington family immigrant to America. Written by Nicholas D. Garrett. Edited by Michael O. Kelly. You can purchase a paperback copy or for your Kindle at Amazon.com slash author slash Nicholas Garrett. You can also purchase the book at George Washington's Birthplace, 1732 Pope's Creek Road, Washington's Birthplace, Virginia. Forward by Michael O. Kelly In 1656, George Washington's great-grandfather arrived in the Virginia colony. After the ship he was sailing on met with disaster, he was essentially shipwrecked and forced to make his way in Virginia. And make his way he did in glorious fashion, through royal connections, hard work, and a sense of fairness not normally found in the elite classes of the colonies. He was repeatedly appointed and voted into positions of great authority, including membership into the House of Burgesses and a commission as lieutenant colonel in the militia. In addition, he married three times, took part in raising over a dozen children, managed several plantations, most likely without the use of African or Irish slaves, and ran at least one grist mill. About 350 years later, a friend, Nick Garrett, asked me to read a manuscript he had written about John Wesley Washington, George Washington's great-grandfather and the first Washington family immigrant to America. In it, I found a very interesting story that revealed many facts I hadn't learned before, although I have lived in the Mid-Atlantic since 1990. I knew about the Maryland Toleration Act of 1649, but I had never heard of Ingalls' Rebellion, which led to it, nor had I heard of Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia. I recommend a greater inquiry into these events by all readers. They are fascinating, or at least they were to me. What I found in Nick's book was a fascinating history lesson disguised as an easy read. His narrative style flows easily and draws the reader toward the conclusion. The reader will find themselves transformed into 17th century colonial life, connected to the lives and deaths, the politics of 17th century colonists, as well as many of the native tribes that were slowly being pushed off their ancestral lands. Nick spent several years researching the history of John Washington, both in Virginia and Maryland on this side of the Atlantic, and using the internet he was also able to research documents from several locales in England, such as Thomas Sutton's hospital and school. John Washington got his education, the Washington family estate at Saulgrave Manor and others. Some of the writings on both sides had contradictions, which Nick has researched, catalogued, and determine the most likely scenario based on the facts contained in the primary sources. Reading the stories about John, his siblings, wives, children, stepchildren, and foster children, immerses the reader into life in colonial Virginia and Maryland in a way that is almost visceral. You hurry through the pages, wanting to get to the next, but you don't want to hurry to the point of missing some salient point. I highly recommend this book to students of early American history, Washington family enthusiasts, and to anyone who enjoys a great story. Introduction Amphilus made her way to the window, carefully pulled back the drapes, and looked out onto Frogmore Street. Down the hill she could see the tithing barn at the parsonage place. Looking the other way, she scanned the homes of her neighbors in the twilight of the English countryside. Relief set in, at least temporarily. It had been a generally quiet day. Quiet in that none of Oliver Cromwell's troops had charged through on horseback, kicking up the dust and leaving the ominous rumble of hooves thundering into the distance. It had been a quiet day in that none of Matthew Hopkins' witch-hunting mobs had come about to take away yet another neighbor on trumped-up charges. Fear of reprisal, superstition, and desperate living had come to mark the lives of the once-proud family of Amphilus Twigden Washington and her frequently absent husband, the Reverend Lawrence Washington. 
At present, the Washington family coat of arms was more of a liability than a seal of pride. For ancestors of George Washington living in 17th century England, decades of loyalty to the crown had placed a mark on the family. To make matters worse, Amphlis's only living parent, her stepfather, Andrew Noling, had recently taken ill. Andrew took care of her during the long stretches of time that Lawrence was away for work. She often did not see her husband Lawrence for days at a time, and the only visitor they had welcomed in recent days was a representative from the church in Purley where Reverend Lawrence had been rector until his recent expulsion. The church gave the Washingtons one-fifth of the parish tithes from a relief fund. Far from an act of charity, Amphilus had sued the new rector, Roger Jones, for the money, and won. Amphilus breathed a sigh of relief, knowing the family would eat that day, and maybe the next. The same vignette played out over and over and day after day for the great-grandmother of America's first president, George Washington. During those days, countrywide issues affected everyone and overshadowed the personal struggles of individuals. War, mass witch hunts, widespread poverty, religious uncertainty stemming from the now century-old Protestant Reformation, and the British crown itself under attack were daily realities. Yet through all of that, Amphilus felt God's judgment was fair and just, that maybe the more well-to-do that had benefited from the king's spoil system for so long somehow deserved retribution. There was unquestionably a sense among the Anglican Christians that one's actions received direct response from God by way of rewards and punishments. The great migration of thousands of Puritans fleeing from England that very moment were escaping from the judgment of people just like the royalist Anglican Reverend Lawrence Washington. Lawrence was not at fault for recent events. He was simply a cog in a much larger machine, whose ambitions came with certain duties and unspoken expectations. He was a highly educated man. For the fifth son out of many siblings, to have such a privilege was becoming increasingly unique. Yet for royalists loyal to the king and the Anglican church like the Washingtons, such favor had been a way of life until the rise of the parliamentarians. When he was 17 years old, Lawrence entered Brasenose College, Oxford. He was a student from 1619 to 1623, during which time he earned his undergraduate degree. Within days of his graduation, Lawrence was made a fellow. A few years later, he also earned a master's degree and rose to the position of a principal officer at the university. He was tapped for the post when Oxford's chancellor, William Laud, the Archbishop of Canterbury, promoted him to replace a prominent Puritan during the cleansing of the university. William Laud had been on a personal mission to restore the church to what he considered its pure state during the early days of the Protestant Reformation about a century earlier. After the split between the Protestants and Catholics throughout Europe, England had a wholly different Reformation struggle and developed a model of Christianity that stemmed from the leadership of the British crown itself. It was similar to Catholicism, but had its own rites, rituals, and hierarchy. It came to be called the Anglican Church, but far from a unifying body, it led to religious and civil disagreement among the English populace. Laud and Washington were on the side of power, the side of the establishment. Puritans were falling out of favor with institutional leadership at the religious, academic, and social levels. Many personal friendships were torn apart as individuals chose sides for varieties of reasons, this was at least the Reverend Lawrence Washington's experience. As a consequence of Laud's efforts and simultaneously Washington's desire to advance, Lawrence was forced to face those very men intimately known to him and go along with their expulsion. Not that his say could have changed anything. Laud's attempts to force uniformity of worship ran contrary to all shades of Puritan opinion. <laughs> 
Lawrence's very own roommate, who had been the proctor of the prestigious university, was expelled in the presence of King Charles I after Laud made an impassioned speech condemning him. Within days, Lawrence himself was given the position of his ousted friend. Now each Monday in his new role as proctor, Lawrence Washington met with school leadership to devise ways they could further control the school, which was done largely by unseating Puritans at the behest of William Laud. Washington remained as proctor for only a few years before his life took a dramatic turn. He had met Amphilus Twigden, a maid servant at Oxford, and commenced an intimate relationship with her in secret. Their love affair continued for years. By December of 1633, they were married and starting a family. Heritage, likely designed with the good intention of sanitizing George Washington's pedigree, has suggested that simultaneous to their wedding was the pregnancy and birth of their first son, John Washington, George's great-grandfather. However, it can be said with some certainty based on later records that their first son was born in December of 1631. Either the relationship commenced prior to their marriage and a premarital pregnancy brought John into the world, or there is confusion about the dating of events between the Julian and Gregorian calendar systems. At Saulgrave Manor, the Washington's ancestral home in England, scholars adhere to the idea that the marriage preceded John's birth, designating his birth year as 1634. Other scholars studied John Washington's will and note that he identifies himself at 45 years of age in 1675, verifying that he was born in 1631. The birth year of the great-grandfather of George Washington, the first Washington family immigrant to America, is insignificant compared to other questions surrounding the union of Amphilus Twigden and Reverend Lawrence Washington. The fact that Lawrence had devoted his whole life to a certain path and so quickly altered it is compelling. From the time he entered school in 1619, through earning his Ph.D. between 1631 and 32, he now seemed willing to walk away from it all. Seemingly, the Reverend was smitten by a combination of factors capped off by physical beauty, rare intelligence, and a bold demeanor. One wonders what he had in mind with the maidservant Twigden. In religious life, he was under a contract that only provided a few pounds a year, not enough to raise a family. Further, marrying for love was not exactly encouraged in England or the British colonies in North America among higher classes of people. If he only left his position and married as a result of an early pregnancy, which heritage insists is not the case, what other reason could there have been but some infectious forbidden love between them? Perhaps they feared a scandal, exposing the fact that a man devoted to chastity was frequently having sex with a maid could have rocked Lawrence's world. A previously chaste cleric and a maidservant, smitten in secret and outside the bonds of matrimony. Even matrimony would not clean up Lawrence's actions in the public eye because marriage was a sacrament not available to him. Maybe Lawrence did not worry about a scandal hurting him, but impacting the Washington family itself. Among Lawrence's other brothers, two were knights, Sir William Washington of Packington and Sir John Washington of Thropston. Another brother, Henry, would become a war hero. Given all the risks, Lawrence did leave his career behind for his new wife and son. One wonders if they had any period of joy and elation, given the difficulty of their own beginning against the backdrop of such a time of troubles. They could not have foreseen the challenges that all of England would soon find herself facing. Whether he had begged forgiveness among other powerful royalists or they had simply turned a blind eye to his actions, the dramatic shift in his life plan does not seem to have reduced Lawrence's credentials with the king's machinery that much. He had no trouble landing himself the position of rector for one of the richest parishes in England, Purley. For the Reverend Lawrence's parents, Lawrence and Margaret Butler Washington, 
The Washington coat of arms had represented hundreds of years of such loyal gifts from the crown. The Washingtons had been among the gentry. A 16th century ancestor, Lawrence, had purchased a monastery confiscated during the Reformation called Soulgrave Manor from Henry VIII himself. In fact, the Washingtons eventually came to own all the acreage between Soulgrave and Oxford University. The estate represented the close royalist ties of the family. The Washingtons held Soulgrave until the final portion was sold in the mid-18th century. During the early 1630s, when Reverend Lawrence and Amphilus married, Soulgrave was a hotbed for royalist literature and sentiment against the growing rebellion. As England devolved further toward conflict, the newlywed Washingtons felt its hardships. Still, life for them was comfortable enough, not near as bad as it was for peasants and lower-class English people. Even as Lawrence made his way to his new assignment at Purley, though, the town was beginning to grumble in opposition to the crown. As rector, he enjoyed at least a modicum of popularity throughout the parish, given the circumstances. It seems that Lawrence tried to maintain the lifestyle to which Washingtons were accustomed, even as the situation around them was becoming untenable. However, more and more that lifestyle came with greater cost. As Proctor, Lawrence had earned next to nothing. Also, as a fifth child among many siblings, his inheritance would not provide enough to care for a family if he was considered at all in the inheritance. Not to mention Washingtons across England were increasingly in the courtroom, indicating that maintaining the life of a gentry was not as easy as it had been for them a century earlier. People were becoming more and more curious about how royalists like Lawrence were surviving, given their own conditions. Many of the elite found a way to use litigation and courtrooms as tools to perpetuate and keep their wealth. Some records pointed to wills and probate in 1585 for Lawrence of Soulgrave, and the will of a Lawrence E. Washington of Garsden, Wiltshire in 1620. One record showed a lawsuit brought by the Washingtons against John Hanbury and Nicholas Stoddard for a lease of Messwidge in Nottingham and a later lawsuit against Lawrence Washington for money deposited in a trust. They had also gone to court over the condition of some rental properties. Several certifications of residence showed Washingtons moving frequently before the English Civil War. A certain Lawrence Washington moved to Buckinghamshire from London in 1622. But in 1628, records show a move to Middlesex, followed by another residency form in 1628, that showed one going back to Buckinghamshire. In 1629, it appears another Washington of the same name followed him there. These records of the old English courts reveal the confusion occurring for royalists all over England. Further, the records indicate just how difficult it can be to differentiate one Washington from another. This fact is one reason why some uncertainty remains about the lives of Washingtons prior to George Washington's great-grandfather, John. Now the Reverend Lawrence was beginning a totally new life, with a wife and a young child. His opulent parish at Purlee sat on a high hill. The sanctuary had three great arches on each side and a larger one adorning the approach to the altar. Whitewashed walls and... Stained glass windows accented by hand-sewn rugs, pew covers, and the music of an organ during services. Beautiful hand-cut stone and a tall bell tower could be seen all through the countryside. Lawrence led his services in the beautiful church just as the Archbishop Laud had designed to convey the beauty of holiness and harmoniousness of the liturgy. As a firstborn son in a world where primogeniture dictated tradition, young John Washington followed in his father's footsteps from the time he could walk. John knew what awaited him from an early age and likely went up the hill to the church so he could watch his father in action. Boys in John's position grew up by watching their father's sermons and knew as a matter of pride that they were expected to do the same one day. One wonders if the gaiety of youth was overshadowed by the knowledge that he was 
waiting to enter a world that meant conflict for so many during that time. As John waited for the appropriate age to enter school in preparation for Oxford, one wonders what observations he made about entering a system that many in his own community were beginning to criticize. One would imagine that John's observations were made from the vantage of a child that enjoyed a higher standard of living than most children in England. Nobility had grown steadily in wealth and stature through the early 17th century. There were gentry, like the Washingtons, a general population of laborers and tradesmen, and below them, yeomen farmers. In one sense, the quality of life was determined by how many times a week a family could afford to eat meat, whether every day, several times a week, or only once a week or less. Thank you for listening to the foreword and introduction of Shipwrecked in the Land of King Tobacco, the first Washington family immigrant to America by Nicholas D. Garrett. Check back periodically for the next installment. Please support this important nonfiction historical work by supporting me on Patreon. You can also watch videos on YouTube where John Washington has his very own channel. You can also visit John Washington on Facebook and Twitter. Please take note of the various tiers of support available on this Patreon page. Finally, with it being summer, I encourage families to visit Pope's Creek, George Washington's birthplace, Ferry Farm, where George Washington spent some of his formative years, and Mount Vernon, George Washington's home for most of his life. The Jamestown settlement also factors heavily into this narrative and is a wonderful visit. This book is available in paperback or for your Kindle. You can purchase it on Amazon or in person at George Washington's birthplace.